The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I fear? When people talk about me, the Lord is the strength of my life. I don't care. When the doctor says that I need to come back in two weeks as opposed to an annual checkup, the Lord is the strength of my life. I won't be afraid. Whom shall I fear? When I work so hard to love somebody, only to have them take advantage of me, whom mm, 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 shall I fear? Good morning, again, First Central. It's an honor always to stand here in front of you and all of your beautiful smiling faces, sharp clothes, nice hair, fine glasses. I see all that, right? It's nice to see people who have, as Otis Moss says, been kissed by the rays of God's sun. I want to acknowledge our pastor um, who's been here for 14 years as we start to prepare for his anniversary next year uh, for the opportunity that he gives me personally and, and those who are, are practicing ministry in the ministry circle. Uh, our deacon chairs, co-chairs, right? And our deacon board, trustees, uh, the one-way youth ministry, the parents who have partnered with the one-way youth ministry, the Christian education ministry, the music ministry, uh, the ministry circle, the trustees, all the officers. Of course, my beautiful mom upstairs, my beautiful wife over there, right? We're going to shout out my mother-in-law because 50% of my wife's looks come from my mother-in-law, right? <laughs> uh, that being said, uh, I was going to name the sermon something. Uh, um, but I think we'll change the name for a thought we'll, we'll go with. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? The scripture was read earlier, Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. Uh, I trust that you'll go home and reread it. Um, so I'm going to just read a few verses. Again, this Mark chapter 5. Beginning at verse 9. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the impure spirits came out, and he went into the pigs, and they went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and the countryside 
and the people went out to see what happened. When Jesus came, or when they came to Jesus, depending on your translation, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons, sitting there dressed and in his right mind. The King James says clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. When they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons, sitting there dressed and in his right mind, they were afraid. Whom shall I fear? Let us pray. Eternal and all wise Father, gracious and merciful God, it is once again, O Lord, that we come to you in the preaching moment, expecting you to do something marvelous. God, we have sang. God, we have pressed. God, we have entered into uh, this church expecting you to do something different because although you are consistent, you never run out of new opportunities and possibilities in our lives. Right now, God, at the preaching moment, we ask that you allow Daryl David Moore to decrease, increase your spirit within. Hide me behind the blood of your cross. Allow the words of my mouth and a meditation of my heart to be acceptable in your sight. God, bind anything that might be distracting to this word, God, so that your people may walk away with what it is that you have them to walk away with. Have your way in this house, O oh Lord, because it is your house, so that a seed may be planted, that a soul may be saved, that the church may be edified, and most of all, Father, that you will be glorified. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus. And let the people of God who love God say, Amen, Amen, Amen. You may remember that I've mentioned before that I am an avid watcher and fan of cartoons. I, I, I prefer uh, the cartoons that I grew up watching, and one of my favorite cartoons is Scooby-Doo, Where Are You? Yes. You may uh, remember re me mentioning the fact that I like Scooby-Doo. If, if you've never seen Scooby-Doo before, Scooby-Doo is a... A cartoon that revolves around mysteries. The main characters being four uh, teenagers and a dog named Scooby-Doo. And basically, every episode of this serial uh, uh, cartoon has the same format. There is a crime committed, and coincidentally, these teenagers and their dog are usually in the same town or area where the crime is committed. The crime that is committed is typically thought to be committed by some kind of specter, ghost, ghoul, or goblin. Freddy, who is the oldest one, who is the owner of their van called the Mystery Machine, always wants to get involved to find out uh, who committed the crime to solve the mystery. He's brave and, 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 and he understands that, that often the, the, these demons, ghouls, ghosts, and goblins are not real, but, but they are just uh, people dressing up or pretending as if they have something wrong with them so they can get away with the crime. However, there are two people in this cartoon, Shaggy and the dog named Scooby-Doo, that any time that they see the wind blow and the curtain moves, that, that any time that, that the cloud covers the, the, the moon and, and, and it becomes a little bit darker, that, that any time a floor creaks, they jump out of fear because they are scared of the unknown. It's a shame that in our world today, many of us live being scared of the unknown. If you are scared because you are, have been exposed to the unknown, I believe that there's a word for us today that shows us how to deal with some of those things. The scripture says that, that after a long day of teaching on the parables, that was capped off 
with the miraculous calming of the storm, that Jesus and his disciples jumped on the boat, or they were on the boat, that's when the, the storm was calm, and they land in the region of the, of the Gerasenes. As they are in the Gerasenes, soon as they're walking, it says that there is a man who runs up to Jesus. This isn't an ordinary man, no. The scripture says that the man has inside of him an unclean spirit. This man with the unclean spirit, it says, is, ha, has a propensity towards violence. The scripture says that, that he cuts himself and, and that, that he lives near the tombs. And, and he's cutting himself and, and, and he lives near the tombs and, and the scripture says that, that they put chains on his arms. And no matter how many times they tried to shackle him, he, he kept breaking the chains. You say, Reverend Moore, that, that sounds a little creepy. Maybe you like Shaggy and Scooby. If you saw something like this, you would want to run in the opposite direction. But, but, but it's here that we can learn some lessons about fear and about faith and how they can be interconnected. You see, the, the, the man was put to the outside of town. He was living, but he was living where there was no life, in the tombs. He was, he was living in, in, in the mountainous, because they didn't have graveyards like we have, areas that, that had holes cut in them where they would take big stones and, and, and move the stones out of the way and put dead people inside. He was living where nobody wanted to go. Perhaps you feel as if you're living where nobody wants to go. Perhaps you, you turn on the television and, and you realize that, that our mayor is allowing people to be priced out of New York City. And you feel as if you can't move out of the neighborhood that you're living. You realize that your children are receiving a third rate education with used textbooks that the police officers that should be serving and protecting are policing us with a military style of policing that nobody wants to put money into our areas because it's a place where nobody wants to go this man that had an unclean spirit, needed somebody to speak to his issue. And the scripture says that the solution that they had that to speak to the issue was to put him in chains. It's a shame that we live in a nation where 2.2 million people are incarcerated. We live in a nation where 67% of people, when leaving jail in three years, will return in 73 after five years. Because instead of speaking to the issues, they want to push people to the side or to the margins of regular society. They want us to be living amongst the dead. But look, you see, Jesus, unlike regular rabbis, wasn't scared to go to places that were unclean. We have to understand that, that, that for a, a Jewish leader in the first century to be next to anything unclean, that was considered to be taboo. They wouldn't sit on a chair that was unclean because it would make you unclean. If you were sick and you were unclean, you needed to go away until you were better. And then you had to go to the priest and the priest would declare you clean. If you had an issue, like the woman that had an issue of blood, you had to stay away from your friends and family. You, 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 you had, to, you had to, 
to, to, to isolate yourself because the church had better things to do than to clean up people who were unclean. The question is, what are you afraid of? It's a shame when the church, especially the black church, the church that marched, the church that, that arranged the sit-ins, the church that had Africans humming in a foreign language about a God, that church is scared to connect with people that are deemed unclean by society. I know that doesn't happen here at First Central, but at somebody's Baptist church somewhere, there are people who are scared. And they think that, that we can fix these issues with easy cliches like telling young men to pick their pants up and telling young ladies to close their legs. Now those might be part of the solution, but we can't fix problems with platitudes especially if we're afraid. So Jesus is walking. And one of the first things that, that we can learn, I've already mentioned, is that if we want to realize the connection between faith and fear, we need to be different. Are we going to be the church that is okay with allowing people to be relegated to a certain socioeconomic class, uh, allowing people to be relegated or, 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 or being grouped in a place where they only receive a certain kind of justice? Are, are, are we as a church, are we going to be okay with allowing people to die slowly? Or are we going to be different and go outside of the walls, go beyond Wright Street to go to where real ministry needs to take place? Jesus does. And what we realize is that some of the most amazing things happen. Jesus really doesn't have to do a lot of work. Once Jesus steps his feet on the shore, the man who is hurting runs up to Jesus. A lot of times, Brother Eric, Minister Eric, Minister Smith, a lot of times, we feel ill-equipped to help people out because we haven't, or we feel we haven't had the proper training. But the truth is that when people are hungry, when people are hurting, when people are in need, they will let you know. We just have to position ourselves in the place and learn how to recognize that they have the need. So Jesus, is next to where this man is. This man who, who is violent. And he realizes something that the other people didn't realize. Perhaps it's because of the blood or perhaps it's because of the scars or perhaps it's because Jesus is the God man and knows everything. But, 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 but if we, we do a close reading of the scripture, the scripture says, that night and day among the tombs, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. Because it's most often that when people are in need, the only people that they hurt are themselves. Perhaps you're in need this morning. I ask you, what are you afraid of? How does it look when somebody hurts themselves? It can look like this man. You can cut your wrist because you don't want to live anymore. Or it can look like drinking a little bit too much too many times a week. It can look like selling drugs or using drugs. It can look like placing your faith in deliverance inside of a sexual relationship that may satisfy you or that might give you gratification, excuse me, but will never satisfy you. It can look like watching the TV and getting mad because we have a crazy administration in the White House. 
but never voting because in apathy we believe that nothing is going to change. It can, it can look like being upset because she walked out on you and then taking your rage out on your daughter who looks too much like the she who left. It can look like many things, but in the end they only hurt or they primarily hurt us. Because nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I want to be addicted to heroin. Nobody wakes up and says, I want to drink so much that my liver fails. Nobody wakes up and says, I want to sleep around until they call me a hug. Nobody does that. But it's when they're trying to find healing and they have no direction to the healing that they end up being in places where people are scared of them because they're hurting themselves. And so Jesus, the God man, the different rabbi runs up or he walks up and he runs up to Jesus. And the scripture says that the man says, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Don't torture me. It's two very interesting things that we can learn from this part, Amara. One, it's interesting how sometimes people outside of the church, Sister Johnson, recognize God more than people inside of the church. And then, and then Amara and John, what's, what's more interesting than that is that he says, don't torture me. He looks at Jesus and recognizing that Jesus is connected to the religious leadership, he assumes that Jesus is there to make his situation worse. Why is that? The only assumption that I can make is that in his past, he has had some contact with people from the church who made his situation worse. Sometimes, the people of the world, the people who are hurting, are dealing with trauma. They're suffering. They're dealing with pain and agony because the church people, instead of trying to heal them, are trying to get us to look and conform to us because it makes them feel, us feel comfortable. We're trying to tell the sister that only has one skirt that her skirt is too short. We're, 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 we're arguing so much about sexual orientation and, and selected gender identity that we don't realize that, that people have souls that need to be saved and that they have hearts that need to be healed. I know even in the education ministry, we're so concerned that somebody quotes the verse correct and they read the correct translation. They don't mispronounce the Greek or Hebrew and they recognize that there's Aramaic in the Bible. We, we're doing all of that. And when we don't see people for who they are, but we try to make them who we want them to be, all we do is add insult to injury. And so this man says, Rabbi, please don't come to torture me the way that the rest of them have. But Jesus is not only different, Jesus is compassionate and empathetic. Perhaps the man needs to stop cutting himself. It's better for the man to be moved from solitude and, and, and exile and, and living among the tombs to, move and, to be moved into regular society. But before we get there, Jesus sees the man as a person. He looks at the man and he says, what is your name? Sister Rue, bet you know that everybody that you come across has a name. It might be a name 
that you don't know. The problem, I think, with the church and sometimes with community politics, again, not this church, is that we're so busy seeing people as problems as opposed to people. And if we just take a second to ask people who they are, what are you going through? What is it that you would like me to do for you if I can? Then we will be much more effective. Let me give you an example. I, I, I'm not going to be much longer. So one time I was at this conference in, uh, right outside of Boston. It was a Holy Ghost. Fresh Encounter was the name of the conference. It was supposed to be some magical, mystical, Holy Spirit-filled healing. And at the time, I had something going on in my life. I was a full-time, just regular stuff going on, not craziness, you know, full-time husband, full-time father, full-time ministry, full-time school, full-time, just all that just stuff going on. The woman comes over to me, and she says, young man, would you like me to pray for you? I wanted God to show me how I can manage my schedule better. I say, yes. She starts praying. Lord, we ask that you move in the A-E-I-O-U. God, we just ask that you move from the bananas to the apples. God, we ask. She prayed everything that she could think of, but didn't stop to ask me what it was that I wanted God to do in my life. So we see here, Jesus sees the person, and he says, what's your name? But it gets interesting because then the man opens his mouth and he says, my name is Legion because we are many. Sometimes when we open our mouths, our issues speak for us. Sometimes we don't even recognize or realize that we walk around with, with an attitude or a chip on our shoulder. We don't recognize that, that all of the pain that we have, that we've been carrying, as uh, soon as we walk into a room, we change the atmosphere of the room. Like, people feel what is going on inside of us. We don't realize it. And the reason why I mention it is because if you're hurting, you need to realize it. But more importantly, if you're dealing with somebody that's hurting, you need to realize that sometimes the reason why somebody rolled their eyes at you is not because they're a nasty person. It's because they're dealing with something and they just don't know how to deal with it. What are you afraid of? The man's issue speak for him. I said it once and I'll say it over and over again. It's a shame when somebody allows their issues, especially their past issues, to be what defines them. I understand the scripture says that Rahab was a harlot, but she was more than a harlot. She was a hero. I understand that people like to say that, Do that Thomas doubted, but Thomas was more than a doubter. Thomas was this one that said, Jesus, if you're going to die, then we'll go and we'll die with you. Don't let somebody say that you are a crackhead because you used to smoke crack. Don't let somebody say that you're a bastard because your dad walked out. Don't let somebody say that you're poor because you, you're, 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 you're food insecure. Don't let them call you by your issue. Issues. We are all fearfully and wonderfully made, created in the Imago Day, in the image of God. So Jesus speaks to the man, and the man's issues respond to Jesus. And Jesus does what I would hope that the church would do. Jesus, knowing that he wants to make the man whole, realizes that first he has to deal with the issues because the issues are going to always be in the way. The scripture says, and I'm not making it up, you go home and read it. The scripture says that even before Jesus could speak, that the issue said, hey, let us just hang around here just a little bit longer. Don't, don't banish us, but, but there's a herd of pigs over there. Let us go over there. Something that we can learn is that Jesus is good at moving things out of our life. 
but sometimes the things are in our life and we don't separate from them enough. Listen, one of my favorite movies is New Jack City. There's a scene in New Jack City with Chris Rock's character, his name was Pookie. They needed to have an inside man inside of the dope house. But the problem was, Pookie had just recently got off of the, 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 the junk. And so they put him with a little camera inside of his belt, and he went inside, and for a few days, he was good working out, trying to find out uh, about Nino Brown's operation. But one day, he took one little rock, and, because the rock was within reach, that's the point. We, we gotta understand that the issues and the demons are always gonna try to stay within reach, but we need to realize that we don't want to stay with them. And so because it was in reach, although he was good, he stayed in the situation and he dabbled. And then we see at one point in the movie, because he's high, he's acting a fool, and they realize that something is wrong with him. And then they realize that he has the camera in his belt. And he looks down and he says, Scotty, they're going to kill me. When we don't get away from our issues, when we think that it's okay, but I can, just, I can just dabble and be around all of this stuff. Our issues are always plotting to get back into our lives. And so Jesus says, all right, you want me to throw them in the pigs? I'll let you go in the pigs. And the issues go in the pigs, and then the issues run themselves off the cliff. The legion didn't know that the pigs were gonna run off the cliff. But that's what happened. Here's what's crazy about this part of the story. The story says, Ma, that, that and, and, and I, I read the scripture that, that, that those who were tending to the pigs ran off and reported to the town and the countryside, and the people went to see what happened. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is first century. In Israel, why were people even tending to pigs to begin with? Because you know, ain't no pork going on the fork of these people. But the problem is that sometimes the system is set up to make money or to profit off of the calamity of others, off of the issues of others. And so when you rush down or you march down to the courthouse and you say, I don't understand why my son, my husband, my daughter, my aunt, my niece got a raw deal. Don't you think it isn't because the system isn't benefiting? If, if when you look and you say, and listen, if you eat there, it's all good, I've eaten there. But, but you say, why did they put a Wendy's on Bay Street when they could have put a Whole Foods or something a little different? Because... It, it's not a coincidence that, that they will allow certain people to eat a certain way. And let us know that if they had put a Starbucks over there, then that would be a sign or an indication that the face of the neighborhood would be changing because the system is designed to profit off of the suffering of some people. And we can go on for years. Rent a center. You don't see a retta center in Toad Hill. We buy and sell used gold. I mean, we could go on and on. And so, and so we, we, we see how these people were profiting. And the people, because their profits were getting messed up, they came to check out the situation. It's a shame that the people were more concerned with their prophets than they were concerned with the man being healed. But despite that, what I'm telling us and me, because I'm part of this Christian thing, is that when we do ministry, real ministry, ERA, we need to be prepared for criticism. They came in, they looked around, and, and, and they were ready to give Jesus the business because he messed up whatever it was that they were doing with these pigs. And the scripture says, the scripture says that when they came to Jesus and saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons 
was sitting there clothed and in his right mind. I'll stop there for a second. I, I've been asking you over and over again, what are you scared of? Why are you scared of these people who have issues, especially because, well, we'll get there. Jesus didn't just pray for the guy, but Jesus put clothes on his back. Jesus didn't just invite him to the church, but Jesus made sure that, that he could look like somebody that was trying to get their lives together. We seem to forget, and I believe because of right-wing evangelicalism that has said that it is not a, a gospel that has social dynamics with. We seem to forget that God is not only concerned with our hearts and our soul, but, but, but in his prayer he says on earth as it is in heaven that we need to feed people, that we need to make sure that the laws are changed. We need to get people out of jail. We need to put clothes on people's back. But the scripture says when they saw that the man was clothed and in his right mind, it says that they were afraid. My question, brothers and sisters, changes. It is not what are you afraid of, but it is what are they afraid of? Let me tell you what they're afraid of. They're afraid of the church that realizes it is the church. They're afraid of the church that realizes that they're connected to the one who has power, but not only power, but authority. They're, they're, they're afraid of the church that recognizes that they have enough resources. They're afraid of the church that recognizes that if they stop competing with the church down the block, the church that speaks a different language, the church that's a different denomination, that the church can change lives. Because if the church changes lives, the people will come to the church. And if people come to the church, the people from the church will then go out and bring more people into the church. And if more people come into the church, then more people will go out of the church. And more people will come into the church. And guess what? If a drug dealer comes into the church, he'll go out of the church and he'll stop selling drugs. And he'll get his drug dealing friend to come into the church. And let that happen over the course of two or three years. If a prostitute does the same thing over the course of two or three years. If a corrupt politician does the same thing over the course of two or three years. If a hard-headed child does the same thing over the course of two or three years. If a cheating husband does the same thing over the course of two or three years, our communities will be vastly different. And then the people will be scared. They won't be scared because they're in chains. They won't be scared because the lies that they say that we're all mean and the lies that they say that they're all violent. But they'll be scared because we will be able to take back our communities and buck against the system. says that they were scared of Jesus because he changed the man's life. I got a question to ask you. Are the people who know that you go to church afraid of you? What is it that you're doing? What is it that makes you different? We're salt and light or we're supposed to be. How is it that you flavor a situation that people are scared to invite you into their situation. How is it that when you walk in a room that people will change their thought or their behavior if they don't even change their attitude, they will try to pretend. What is it that you're doing in the name of Jesus that is scaring? <sighs> this man had a legion of demons taken out of him. And the people missed the blessing because they were more concerned about their money than the man. And they were scared of the church. And there's one last thing that I want to look at in this text. It's the man. The man says to Jesus, I want to come with you. And Jesus says the craziest thing. Literally, as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who was formerly known as the man possessed with the unclean spirit begged Jesus to let him go. 
But the scripture says that Jesus didn't let him go. The scripture says that, that, that you, you go to your own people and, and tell them how much God has done for you and, and how God has had mercy on you. And I've just covered all of that in the fact that there is a cycle to testimony. But, but, but what, what we need not to miss is that when Jesus gets to the other side, Jesus does more ministry. We not only need to be different church, we not only need to be compassionate and empathetic, we need not only to be recognizable but recognizably different, we, we need to, to not only be prepared for criticism, but we need to be willing to work more. Sometimes I believe that we treat ministry like it's grade school. We treat ministry like it's college. We treat ministry like it's an exam for our certifications so that we can keep our job. Oh, I, I got my bachelor's and I don't need to go on for another degree or, 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 or I've, I've graduated and I'm going into the military and I, and I, don't, I don't need to, to do anything else. So I got this job and all I need to do is put 20 hours in to get the certification and I'm good and I'm gonna collect this check. No. This isn't a you preach the gospel to one person and then you turn it off because you've done what you need to do and that's it. Well, you said, Reverend Moore, how do I know when I've done all that I need to do? It's a little morbid, but one way is when you've done all you need to do, God is gonna take you home. So as long as you have breath in your lungs, long as your heart is pumping, Understand that you have more work to do. And unlike Scooby-Doo and Shaggy, who didn't realize that the monsters were just people behind masks, I'm asking you to recognize that the streets of our community are hurting. And if we won't do it in the name of Jesus, then who will? That's your charge. Do what you can. You say, well, I'm scared. I don't wanna go there. Be confident, Philippians 1, 6 says, that the God who began the work in you will complete it. So if you're scared, you have to say, God is the strength of my life. Whom shall I fear? God bless you.